When it comes to radio stations and interviews, every single radio station should have an, inter uh, an interview policy or a guide in place, okay? Something that tells you how you go about it, just so that uh, we kind of have the same format. Um, it's the purpose its purpose is to guide presenters in the process of conducting a good interview because it gives them instructions, okay? It gives you techniques and things to do. So an example would be something like an interview should be considered a feature and should have all the characteristics of a feature. So in other words, a beginning, a middle, and an end, as well as a common thread throughout. So remember stories and storytelling. All departments must be target market related and must be passed through the program management. So interviews can't simply be put on air because you think you want to do an interview. Interviews have to go through the programming department. This is whether it's sales or whether it's um, programming interviews. All interviews go through the program manager first before it goes on air. Um, most radio stations would have a policy that all interviews need to be approved. Okay. Commercial radio stations, it's a definite. It has to go through the programming department first. It differs on some com community radio stations, but it should work like this, okay? So what we're going to do now is we're going to work in both your textbooks today. We're going to start with um, your Next Level Radio from page 156 to 159, where we're going to look at how an interview should be conducted. And then we're going to look at what makes a powerful interview, right? So before we can start trying to conduct an interview, if I told you, so I don't know if you've seen the Delicious Fest lineup yet, but there are big people that they're bringing to South Africa, for, for instance, Burner Boy and Babyface. Let's take Babyface. So let's say Babyface is coming to South Africa, like we know that he is. Let's say I'm a very big fan. I really want to interview um, Babyface, but I work for... Jacaranda. Do you think that interview would work on Jacaranda? Thinking about the kind of radio station that Jacaranda is and type of people who would listen to it. Do you think it'll work? Okay, I don't I don't necessarily think it'll work because of I mean the type of music that he makes isn't the the, the music that Jacaranda's fan base, if I can say that, listen to the audience rather. I don't think it's something that they would listen to. Exactly. So, and Kanye also says, no, it wouldn't. So we, when we take into account people we want to interview, we can't simply think about whether we like this person or not. It's about whether it will fit the specific target market. So let's take YFM. Do you think it'll work on Y? I Kanye? don't think it would work on YFM either, because YFM is more of like a radio station for the youth and Babyface's music is like R&B. Maybe like Kaya FM would would um, do an interview with him. Um, I think that it would simply because, okay, he does do R&B, but a bit of Afro here and there. And sometimes YFM actually does play like African acts and all that. So I think it kind of would work. Okay. So perhaps there might be a show specifically on why that it would work for, but I think the main overall mm. target market, it's not um, an audience, not a core target audience for Babyface, yeah. but perhaps for your P2 listener, but definitely it would work on Kaya and Metro. Yeah. Okay, so this is the kind of stuff that we have to keep in mind when we want to interview someone, right? Um, so let's look at a target market. So if I tell you that there's this radio station called XFM, its primary target market is 16 to 24 year olds. The LSM is 7 to 10. Um, urban South Africans who are trendy, progressive, aspirational, it means the following. Um, all of the interviews on the station and the topic should reflect a strategic objective that serves to increase the percentage of LSM listeners, because that's what we're trying to do, right? Um, with regards to social responsibility topics, they should be across the board topics with a slant towards the portfolios like HIV AIDS, nowadays less that more GBV um, and children's mandates. And interviews related to entertainment, music, sport, current affairs must strictly reflect the interests of the target market. So this last section, if you want to do interviews related to entertainment, music, sport and current affairs, 
um, it will always have to reflect the interest of that specific target market with regards to what you can and can't talk about. But so now we're looking at XFM specifically. Before we can get an interview policy or a guide, we need to know who XFM would be targeting, okay? Who its product and messaging delivery um, would be targeted at. And that person, before I go into that, is called a composite listener or a typical listener, okay? Every single radio station should have an idea of who their typical listener would be. And this will literally differ from radio station to radio station. So what they do is, it's also not something that you can pull out of a hat. It comes from a lot of stats. Uh, so from qualitative stats, obviously, giving you an idea of who your core listener would be. So in this case, we have broken it down. So in the case of XFM, XFM's typical listener, aka the composite listener, would be called Joe. So who is Joe? Me, Joe. Joe is a young, energetic, and passionate South, uh, passionate about South Africa and the world in which he lives. Joe is a huge fan of the world of popular music and entertainment. He's media savvy and tech savvy and always on trend. So Joe understands his responsibilities as a South African and a global citizen. He lives boldly with these responsibilities. So in other words, he's passionate about relationships, sex, friends, family, school, work, and ultimately play. Joe knows what he wants, and he knows that he has to create his own future. Joe loves XFM because XFM is a tribe, a group of people who talk to him, with him, and about him. Joe also uses XFM to be the first of his friends to be in the know on the latest relevant news and trends. That is the who is who and the what is what. With XFM, Joe is encouraged to live boldly and to amplify lives. So that is now our target listener for this specific radio station. Like I said, every good radio station should compose a composite listener to help presenters know who they are talking to. In fact, uh, before you read all of that, this can be broken down per hour as well. OK, we can go further than just the overall listener. So that's my composite listener. But you should also know who's listening to your show base um, out of your audience group. So if we look at the application, the famous talk show host, Larry King, said that the best interviews are conversations. What does that mean? It means I don't just ask you a question and you answer, and then I ask you another question and you answer, et cetera, et cetera. We are having a conversation. Think about when you are interested in a story someone tells you. You would be inclined to say, what happened next? Or, but then how did you get out of the situation? or whatever it might be, because you are interested, okay? That's how the flow of a good interview should go. It shouldn't be you are reading from this page of prepared interviews that you have, okay? So that's what we mean with conversations. So your questions should come from your guests' stories, not from your notes. Yes, your, your notes are there to assist you, but the questions shouldn't be there. It should be what comes naturally next, okay? More organic. You therefore need to be what we call an active listener. Now, what is an active listener? When you listen on a day-to-day -day basis, when people are having a conversation, do you think you are what we call an active listener or do you listen to respond? Maybe a person that picks up on like subtle cues during the conversation and can yeah. add to those, yeah. So, most people, okay, me included, most of you also, most people, when we listen to what someone says, we are not listening actively. So we're not taking it in. We're listening to respond. We're listening to wait for them to finish what they're saying so that we can say something back. Have you ever noticed that? That what's, when someone's saying something, you're not 100% fully engaged. You just want them to finish so that you can now give your say. So the problem is, what that means is that we miss certain cues. Can you says, I'm like that too. Okay. Everyone is, whether they are going to admit it or not, we all do it. Okay. Because it, it takes a lot of efforts to be an, an active listener, because it means you need to actively engage in what that person is saying and take in everything the whole time. Think about your lectures. In lectures, you tend to actively be more actively listening than other times. And think about how drained you are at the end of the day. 
So we don't always actively listen, okay? But when it comes to an interview, you need to be an active listener. Otherwise, you miss those small nuances or those small things that they drop. Especially with politicians, people tend to be extremely good at actively listening on talk radio stations because they do pick up on those small, subtle things that they try and scrape uh, past and then they gun them at that, okay? So you need to be what we call an active listener when you conduct an interview. XFM shows do many interviews on air. So we're back to XFM, eh? Many times these interviews are not properly researched, produced and executed, which means it's very boring for you as the listener, okay? So usually it's the case of guest A is available and they have a lot of followers on Twitter. So let's get them to come into studio. What do we do? We Google guest A um, and we get some what we will believe uh, to be good questions. Like for instance, ah, oh, when did you get into this career? How did you get into it? Tell me about your first song that you released. When are you playing next? Those kind of questions. Then guest, guest A will come into studio and we ask them these questions. This will literally best case scenario lead to a mediocre interview that will do very little to entertain and in, to engage with our guests. When is the last time that you actually heard an interview that really stuck with you, that resonated with you? A lot of people do this. Why? Because they're lazy firstly and secondly, they are uninformed with regards to how they should be conducting interviews, okay? So our aim is to make you great at conducting interviews. So we should want to be excellent, not mediocre, okay? We, you should want to thrive for excellence and to compete with the best interviewers in the world. So our competition is not only other radio stations, but it's YouTube, it's Instagram, it's TikTok, um, all other channels that listeners can go to for content, okay? So you need to compete against all these people when you are conducting an interview. So how do you conduct an interview? It's called the six phase approach to interview prep, right? So um, if you stick to this, you're guaranteed to have an excellent interview. So the magic comes from the first four phases. If you get the foundational phases right, that's the first four, then five, uh, phase five and six will follow quite easily afterwards, right? So the first phase is the quality test of the person you want to interview. So be selective of the guests that book, um, that you book on your show in order for you to be able to get the best results. You need to ask the following four questions. And you need to be able to answer yes to at least two of these before you can go ahead with your interview. So number one, are they a big star with a company like Universal Studios or a high target appeal? And can they tell great stories? Number two, does one of the show players have a high interest in the guest and will this create great entertainment? Number three, are they a great interview, even though they're not a huge name? So are they known for giving great interviews and that they are engaging and entertaining. Number four, will they set up one of the players on the show in some way? So will you be able to get more out of the show from them setting up someone else on your show in such a way that you get a fubby element out of it? So perhaps humor would most likely be happening there. Um, so if we look at someone like Babyface again, then, and you want to see whether you would interview this person. Number one, high target appeal, yes. So there's one. The kind of shows that you, or radio stations where you would put them on should have people that are interested in him. So should have that one. But we at least have minimum two out of four. So you can interview him in essence, okay? Man, please explain the second point of phase one. So does the does one of the show players have a high interest in the guest? So that means are one of the people, one of the co-hosts, for instance, on the on air, um, are they a massive fan? So are they one of those people who's been following his career, um, who really loves him, who will definitely be there to make sure they can watch him live? So that's basically what it comes down to, because 
if you are passionate about something, you are automatically going to sound more passionate on air and make it more interesting for your listener. Okay. So that's what it means with a high interest. It's just, um, are you interested in the guest that you are going to be interviewing? So this is the first phase. Great. Now we lead to phase two, which is pre-production. How long do you think you should spend on prepping for an interview? So doing research on your on your interviewee. Maybe a day, man. Like a whole day. You need to spend at least 60 minutes longer preparing an interview at the interview than the actual length of your interview. So if you're doing a five minute interview, you have to do at least um, 65 minutes of prep. Okay, that's at the bare minimum. You need to gather information from different sources. So even if you spend, um, because you, no one spends the whole day every day finding information, you do other things in between. So if you spend little bits, little bits, little bits to try and get it all together, that'll work. Okay. But minimum an hour longer than your actual interview time. Um, so that you can get enough information. So what do you need to do? You need to read biographies, get up to date on this person's career. For instance, if it's um, someone in the movies or uh, in the film industry, what have they featured in or what have they produced or what books have they written, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so you need to find everything you can on this person. Look on their Twitter accounts, on their whatever, on all their social media accounts, see what you can find everywhere. Then you develop your first set of questions. You sit and you go through the kind of questions you think you want to ask and you develop a story arc okay do you remember what a story arc is well it's a story that'll lead from beginning to end okay so when we say story arc on radio it's something that'll um there'll be one topic that'll play throughout either one show or throughout the day or the week or the month okay so story arc storytelling but from beginning to end OK, so you will develop the story arc, OK, utilizing your storytelling elements, which I hope you remember. And then within this, you create a touch point. So you focus on something because still remember, even a story arc um, should have one main idea, one main thought. This is the why you want to interview this person. OK, so there should be a reason for you to interview anyone. You should never just want to put them on air because they're here. Um, and then you have your touch point and your touch point could be a fun element, something that no other interviewer would do. So, for example, a fun activity like a game, but it needs to be like an interesting game where we get something out of it once again as the listener listener. So what do you do next? Next, you do what we call a pre interview interview. So you interview this person before you are going to interview the person. What does that mean? It means you conduct a 10 minute telephonic pre-interview, interview with a guest. During this thing, you're gonna ask your questions, okay? This is a very foreign concept for South African radio, but it is picking up more and more, um, obviously in the commercial sphere. And it's very common practice in American television um, because it helps them to receive the best response from a guest. So this pre-interview interview needs to happen at least 24 hours before your actual interview, and you'll see why now. So this can be done either by the producer, mostly it would be done by a producer, or it can be done by your actual interviewer if you don't have a producer. So you ask the questions that you prepare, prepared here in um, phase two, and then you ask your guest how they feel about the story arc, um, with your touch point and about the fun element that you've developed. So the thing you want to do with them on air, whether it's something they will do or they won't do, um, because, I mean, not everyone has a great sense of humor. Um, maybe they're more serious or maybe they feel uncomfortable with the way that you want to play the game. Um, so then you, what you do throughout is you make notes. OK, throughout the whole thing, you make notes. You keep notes of what questions have potential for great answers or stories. 
and which questions received very boring, mediocre answers. OK, you gauge their interest in the story arc or the game or the fun element that you want to develop as well. Then also here, this is where you kind of get a much better idea of what kind of person this is, right? That's why you should have quite a few questions prepared. So don't just have like five questions prepared, have a lot of questions prepared um, that you ask because that'll give you a gauge where your best answers will lie, okay? Reason for that being you need a couple of good stories um, before you go on air with this person. But now, doesn't that kill like the excitement and that um, uh, what do you call it when you're in the moment? Well, when you're gonna tell, when you're gonna ask if the fine with the fine element that you're putting into the interview and everything else, doesn't that kill now the whole mood that is gonna be created within the interview, man? It doesn't because you'll see what we're gonna do now. Now we go back to the drawing board. So the questions that you've asked them are not the questions you're gonna be asking on air. Okay. But with the game, you don't tell them um, step A to Z of this thing. You tell them, you ask them about this idea of this is what you would like to do, just to gauge whether they would play along or not. Because imagine you just go on A and start this thing and this guy's like not interested at all. It's going to look bad for him and the station. Yeah. Um, so, Lamil, you oh. asked, man, with the telephone interview with the producer and the guests, giving great responses. Does the host repeat the same questions during the on-air interview? No. Okay, so this is where we're getting to now. So this is stage three or phase three rather. So phase three, we ask our questions, all of them, and we gauge what were what had potential for good answers and what were mediocre answers and how they feel about the elements we want to adopt. Then phase four, now we develop a game plan. Now we go back to our drawing board, okay? And we redevelop what we have. What we want to get out of the interviewer or interview we rather on air is at least three great stories. So you look at your questions and you see where you could have where the answers were leading towards good well good stories. Okay, that's what you want. So then you rewrite your questions in such a way that you get. Um, to the basis of these three great stories that you want them to tell on air. And then you plan um, how you want the conversation to run on air. So you have an idea of how you want the story arc to run. Okay. And then you plan the open ended questions that you're going to ask. Um, and you develop and produce a fun and a different element. Okay. So do you see what we did here? We, in essence, what we did in phase three. We were still gathering information during our pre-interview interview. OK, uh, we were ga gathering information to tell us where the gold is, where the good stories, the juicy stories are that we want to get out on air. Um, through what answers we received and then we we went back now to our drawing board and then we went, OK, cool. When I asked this, I could hear like he was kind of leading that way. So. Maybe I should ask more something more in depth there or like reframe the uh, question a little bit like this or like that. These questions had very boring answers. We don't want those answers at all. So take those out. Do you see what we're doing? So we're crafting the whole interview once again. Also, no close uh, ended questions. And I'm going to tell you why in a little bit. But have you picked up that phases one to four in essence? is done by a producer, not by the host. The most difficult part of this interview is being done by the producer. So the producer is the one who goes out and does the research and narrows down questions and conducts a pre-interview interview and then comes back to the drawing board and then starts finalizing the questions. Um, and then only the host would step in. Phase five. Now you have your questions. Woohoo! OK, what you're doing now is you are going to greet a person when they come in. So you get them to sit down before the interview. OK, normally they need to be there about half an hour prior. Well, some stations, commercial radio stations can be an hour prior. OK, um, then you tell them what the three stories are that you want to get them to tell on air. Again, you don't tell them what your questions are, though. OK, at no point. 
do you send through a list of questions to the person you are interviewing? You give them guidance to what you want, what you want to ask them on it. So then you, melt, you make them feel welcome. You try to make the interview an enjoyable experience for them. So you offer coffee or water, whatever you have, if there are drinks available, and you normally have some merch available to them if it's a commercial station and some community stations also do it. Why are we doing this? Not because we are the nicest people on earth, but because we are trying to focus on the human side. Um, because by focusing on the human side in this matter, you'll make them feel more comfortable and will, as a consequence, achieve more from them being there. Because if we are anxious and stressed, we are going to give you short clipped answers. The more relaxed I am, the better the interview will go. So we want this person relaxed before they go on air. Right, so that's what we're trying to do here. Then we get to phase six, which is the execution phase. So finally, we're going to carry out um, the actual interview. Who is coming now? So how do we do this? We entertain first and we sell second. What does that mean? It means taking a page from late night um, talk shows and discuss what your guest is promoting during the last part of the interview. So the reason that we're doing this is because first and foremost, we need to entertain and keep our passive um, audiences also engaged, right? So active and passive audiences. So we need to make sure that we don't lose them in the first five seconds. And how do we do that? By doing fun, entertaining stuff first. Um, so you talk to the publicists or the handlers or the managers or whoever, and you tell them that the show will promote the guest's project. We know why you're actually here. And the goal is to have a fun and an entertaining conversation first, because this will benefit both the guest and the studio. Okay, It'll benefit the guest regardless of how famous they are already, because you're going to be hearing them doing something fun or interesting, something that will interest you first. Okay, So you entertain first, you sell second. Then you normally surprise your guest, okay? Do something that will pleasantly surprise them. So, for example, in your textbook on page 159, they speak about um, presenters Shabi and Nina um, from AMP 923 in New York City. They recently had the rapper Neo on, on their show, and they surprised him with the audio and video of his kids saying, Hi, Daddy! So, you know, that's like one of those ah moments. And I was listening to... I'm not sure if it was 947 or Jacaranda, but one of the two, um, also not now, like we said uh, a while ago, did an interview with Jesse Clegg, and he was traveling abroad for uh, one of his gigs, and they got his dad on the line. Um, and his dad just said how much he misses, missed him and um, how proud he is of him. So that was also one of those really ah moments on air. So that's what they mean with surprise your guests. Do something, so go over and above, do something that a normal radio station wouldn't because they wouldn't put the effort into it. Okay, And then avoid questions that already provide the answer um, because people won't know how to answer questions like that. That's like me having given you an answer, but then asking a question again that leads to that answer. People always go, huh? But because you don't know whether you want the same answer or how you want them to answer that question. Then we go to yes or no questions. Avoid yes or no questions at all costs. Ask open-ended questions and be specific. Okay? And follow up with questions about their perspectives and their feelings. Why don't we ask yes or no answer questions? Because that's literally it. They're going to say yes or no and then look at you. Right. So you want answers that brings out stories out of people. There's been one interview that I've listened to that started with yes and no answers. And that was Oprah's interview with Lance Armstrong. The first time he actually admitted to using banned substances for cycling. So she, at the beginning of the interview, set him down and said, cool. Have you done this? And he said, yes. Did you know? And you would say yes or no. Da, da, da. So those were yes or no questions at the start of the interview to get this, the interview rolling. Um, so she got the main thing first and then got into it. So it was a it, and it was a very, very big deal when that interview took place. 
Anyway, ask sensitive questions deeper into the interview. Okay, so after you've established a relationship with your guest, then alternate difficult questions with easier ones. So once again, um, Oprah is a good example here because she does that. She makes her guests feel comfortable first. Okay, she makes them feel like she's their friend, they are in a safe space. Then she asks more difficult questions. Again, going back to easier questions to answer, and then again, deeper, more difficult questions. So interview techniques differ. So like I said now, um, her example is this making it you feel safe, like I'm your friend, but other people will do interviews like they're like they are in a boxing ring. So they will literally attack you from beginning to end. Um, like my G on, on podcast and chill. Yeah, that kind of uh, interview technique. But then on the other side of that, you have people like, for instance, Eusebius McKayser, who would full on be like a boxing ring. Like you would feel like you're in a boxing ring and that, yeah, you were punched very hard by the end of that interview because he doesn't let up. And then question clusters. So what is a question cluster? A question cluster is asking more than one question at a time, okay? So that you don't keep asking questions the whole time and um, overwhelming your listener. So it could be something about, or oh, something like, tell me the last time that you lost your cool with, with the director. How did it finally end? What did you learn from that situation? Okay, so that's a question cluster because it's me in essence combining three questions that I want answers to into one instead of asking each of them individually. So these can be effective be, can be effective to help you delve deeper into someone's personality. That's why we do it, these question clusters. So what happens when someone is not available for a pre-interview interview? Do you simply just go on air with them and hope it goes well? The answer is no. Okay, in such a case, it would be wiser to invite the case the, uh, to invite the guest in after your show and to pre-record the interview. Because if you have a pre-recorded interview, it means that you will be able to still get the best out of that guest um, while while they are on air. Because you can edit the interview. Okay, so you can still ask all your questions and everything you want because you can edit the interview afterwards to make it sound entertaining and engaging. You can edit out all the stumbles and ums and ahs. And if they gave a bad question where you had to ask a follow up question, you can edit out the bad answer um, rather and just leave the good answer. OK, so it works best if you can do it like that instead of simply doing it live, because once again, live, you have no control over it if you have not conducted uh, a pre-interview interview. You can do the same thing telephonically. If someone can't come in at all, then you can conduct the pre-interview interview telephonically, okay, as well. Um, and you can use that audio on air also. A pre-recording doesn't necessarily mean that the show won't sound natural or real, okay? You can edit it to sound extremely um, natural. It simply allows for the editing out of unimportant bits of self-promotion on the guest part, um, because that's stuff you try and want to avoid. How do pre-recorded interviews work if the guest is present at the studio? So you ask all the questions that you wanted to ask, okay? This is not live in studio. I'm asking you, so we're going to the recording studio, not the live on air studio. And then I'm recording you while I'm asking all of your questions um, that I would have asked in the pre-interview interview so that I can gauge from the answers and cut them as we go along or rather at the end of it so that I can still have a great interview. So it's not live, it's pre-recorded off air and then cut. That's the six phases of an interview. So just quickly again, what do we do at the start? We look at the target market. We have to know who it is that we are talking to. Okay? Every radio station should have an interview policy. And an interview can be seen as a feature, aka a feature has storytelling elements in them. Feature, uh, interview also has storytelling elements. Okay? Interviews need to run through the programming department. You need to know who you're talking to. 
Um, you need to have a conversation with them, not simply ask a question and want a response. So you need to be what we call an active listener. Okay. The sixth uh, phase approach to the interview prep. First phase, quality test. Why do you want to interview this person? Are they a big staff? Um, do they have a high target appeal? Can they tell great stories? Does one of the show players have a high interest in the guest? So is it is someone perhaps a fan? Will this create great entertainment? Are they a great interview, even though they are not a huge name? And will they set up one of the players on the show in some way? Phase two is your pre-production, where you are prepping your questions, your first set of questions, and where you are developing your story arc, the reason that you have this guest on the air, and you have your touch point, okay? So you have a fun element that no other interviewer would do, um, to something like a game. Then you conduct your pre-interview interview, where you ask all your questions, okay? At least 24 hours prior to the actual interview. You ask them how they feel about your uh, the story arc and the game or whatever you want to do. You keep notes of what are potentially great answers or stories and which ones had mediocre answers because those are the ones we don't want. Then you go back and develop your game plan. Um, by putting your questions back together. Make sure that you have at least three great, great stories that you lead, want to lead your guests into telling and you develop how you want the conversation to run. Your questions you plan as open-ended questions, okay? Again, when you ask these questions on air, go with what comes naturally. If the answer that they give you on air leads you to another question, Okay, because I don't know, it might there might be something more that you want to know now. Don't go the way of your questions that you've written down. Go with your organic uh, question in your head then, because chances are that your listeners are thinking the same thing and wanting to know the same thing at that point. Okay, so go with where the conversation takes you. The questions on your paper is backup. Um, you can use them if you don't have anything else to ask as well. So then you welcome them in, in studio where they sit. You make sure they're feeling comfortable and relaxed and you give them coffee or water or whatever and merch if you have it um, by focusing on their human side before taking them on air. And then again, first you entertain, then you sell and you try to surprise them with something and you avoid questions that already have an answer. You avoid yes and no questions. You ask uh, sensitive questions a bit later on. You ask question clusters. Now we go to Valerie Geller, which is um, in Beyond Powerful Radio. Okay, so we looked at the formatics and the how you do it with the phases. Now we're looking at the how to make it powerful. Okay, so what needs to go into it from an interview technique point of view. Um, so interviews are a necessary part of the information gathering process for news and for talk radio and for music radio. Okay? Um, a powerful interview can capture your audience. It, you, it can keep them listening to the radio. So a boring one can make you disappear immediately Okay, because you'll switch off the radio. Remember that your guests, whoever they are, whether they are rock stars or artists or politicians or experts or specialists in their fields or regular people with stories to tell, may be nervous when they show up. Um, uh, this experience can be very terrifying to people who aren't normally on air. Okay? So they might be nervous or forget what they wanted to say. Um, and then they can become unsure of themselves or where they're heading with the point and become boring, talking endlessly and saying nothing. Okay, So rambling on and on and on and on without a point. So the purpose of an interview is to get this interviewee to open up and to tell you things of interest. That's why they're there. Okay, You want your guests to share information, to tell stories. A good interviewer knows that in order to get the most out of any interview, the person being interviewed needs to feel comfortable, like we said, okay? So they need to kind of forget about the microphone. If needed, don't let them use headphones because when hearing headphones, you hear yourself through them. And a lot of people freak out more with headphones on. So then I'd rather say, just don't use headphones, just talk into the microphone, whatever makes you feel the most comfortable. Um, they should feel heard. 
obviously. If you catch your guest uh, looking at their, watch, at their watch, there's a problem because during a good interview, time should fly. So if your guests are looking at their watch, it means it's not the greatest interview, okay? One of the best things you can do to start your interview off well is to introduce your guest in a compelling way that will excite your audience and make them want to hear what your guest has to say. Hence those stories that you are that you compiled when you're asking them during your prep phases. Um, so you would kind of want to start along those lines, not by saying we have a three time Academy Award winner on our show today. Because that tells me nothing about the person. Tell me something about the person, something that's exciting or interesting for me. Um, it's up to you as the interviewer to present your guests so that the audience cares about what they will have to say. That's your job. Grab their attention with powerful storytelling. You want the audience to stick with it, not to tune out. You don't want to lose them at any point. First and foremost, that means you have to maintain control of your show. Um, if the interview hits into a dull direction, grab it, steer it back into a different direction, okay? Change the discussion. That's why you have these prepared questions um, if whatever direction you're going in isn't working. Often you'll be faced with interviewees who have their own agendas, most of them do, um, and want to use you and your airwave to promote to promote their ideas or their books or their newest movie that they're playing in or whatever it might be. Um, and this can be a difficult situation because you don't want to upset them, but also you might want specific answers out of them, which they are trying to avoid. So one method to get them to talk is getting it a little bit wrong, if we say it that way, okay? Especially if you have an uncooperative interviewee. So CNN's former nightly host, again Larry King, is notorious for asking the dumb question. He claims he doesn't read the books of the authors he's interviewing and that he doesn't do a lot of show prep. Um, his key is to ask the questions members of his audience would ask if they had the chance to interview the guests. Okay. There's an example of how one um, individual interviewer um, would work, but people work differently on different methods, depending on who you are talking to. Okay. There's, if we look at, his, his name is Stig Arne Nordstrom, um, on page 181 in your textbook, they give us his example. He says, let's say you have a politician who's downplaying the significance of a proposed tax hike. You might say, so your plan means no tax increase, increases for anyone. The politician will then feel frustrated and misunderstood. People in his profession can't stand that. He might come back with something like, no, no, no. My plan would be would mean a uniform increase for almost everyone. And then you've completed several things here. You got him to talk and to explain in a short form that's easily understood. Um, and you've landed the perfect radio interview sound statement because you can cut that and reuse that thing over and over. In sh um, it's so short and to the point, and it cuts through the smoke and mirrors your interview was trying to use to, hit, to hide his true agenda. Okay, Don't worry about the audience thinking that you're an idiot for misunderstanding the interviewee. If, if, it, if the interview is pre-recorded, you can cut out the dumb question and just um, air the tight, succinct answer. So that's another way of doing it. Okay, so that's two different people showing you their two different ways of getting those answers out of um, out of uh, interviewees. But each interview will have a different way of working. Okay, like I told you pre uh, earlier as well, Oprah uses the thing about she's your friend. Um, Eusebius uses the thing about like being in a boxing ring. So every interviewer and hosts work differently. It depends on your specific strengths. So you work to your strength, whatever works best for you, okay? The secret to conducting a great interview um, is the ability to draw the powerful stories out of people and to gather new information in an interesting way where you're also getting to know the person at the same time. So it, in essence, what it is, it's, it's you talking to someone and getting the best from anyone it's one of it's me interviewing one of you now and trying to get all the best out of you um, and use that on air 
So the more relaxed and at home someone will feel, the better it will go. The closer an interview can feel to a real conversation, like I said earlier, the more organic it is or feels, the better it works. It's not question answer, question answer. It's like a flowing conversation. Powerful listening. In an interview, the star is the topic or the guest, not you as the host. That's a big one to remember. Listening is key. Remember, interested is interesting. If you're bored by the topic, odds are you are bored. Um, you're boring your in, uh, audience as well at the same time. Okay. Your opening questions will depend on the circumstances. There's no right or wrong approach to getting a great interview. Um, that sense of approach is a skill that you will develop by listening, by keeping on listening. Okay. Um, there's a part on listening that I'm going to play for you, or, or not play for you, read for you. Um, yeah, in a, in a little while, because I really think it's something you need to hear. I absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite pieces about listening. Anyway, before we get there, tips for interviewees. Please be available and flexible. If the interview time has been changed, uh, be gracious. So this is not for you as the host. Remember, this is now for the interviewee. If you want to make sure you get a copy of the show, have someone record it for you. Because if you want to get hold of an interview you did on the SABC, for instance, you pay for that interview. Okay. Don't know if you knew that, but now you do. If you're an author, please don't repeat the name of your new book or your website over and over because listeners will get annoyed. Forget that there's a larger audience. You will be much more effective if you speak to the host one-on-one. -on -one. Try and relax. Be yourself. Radio is personal and intimate. Listeners like to be spoken to in that way. Okay, watch your language, aka watch your swearing, watch your whatever slang you want to use. Keep to the point. If you don't have anything interesting to say, ask the host for another question. Turn off your phone. That's a big one. Mobile phones, um, well, radio stations normally just have a rule saying that as soon as you enter the studio, your phone needs to be off or on silent, or they actually might tell you to just leave it outside the studio. Don't bring a lot of notes into the studio and read from them because you're going to sound like you are reading live on air and it's going to sound boring. Ask for what you need. Do you understand the process? You should feel um, in control as much as possible. Okay, as much as you, as the host, are the, um, is the one that's in control of the show, the interviewee should also feel in control where they are sitting and in the environment. Can you stop any time? Is it being recorded or is it live, direct, and anything goes? So you need to explain to them also whether. I mean, if it's live, they can't just randomly stop talking and say, can we do that again? Because it's live. Okay. So these are the things that matter. Have you eaten? There's nothing more embarrassing than a microphone picking up the growling of your hungry stomach. Okay. Um, also, that, like it's not on here, but chappies. Tell them not to chew chappies while on air. Don't be rigid. In a normal conversation, the interview may uh, take a turn that has nothing to do with your agenda. It happens. A skilled interviewer does not stick to a script. Listen to the questions and answer them. Speak to the host as you would to a friendly but uninformed stranger so that they can understand it. So forget the long hello, like we've said uh, yesterday as well. Keep the introduction and greeting short and to the point. Listening is the key to successful interviews. Don't stick to a list. Often the best next question comes from the, from the answer to the last one. <clears throat> Does that make sense? So the best, best next question comes from the answer that they, that they just gave you. Don't ask yes or no questions. Ask how or why questions. If you didn't get enough of an answer, don't be afraid to ask again. This is especially important in recorded interviews when you're looking for that perfect sound bite, especially if you want to cut the sound to use it as a sound bite on air, then ask the question again if you haven't gotten the answer that you needed. Curiosity counts. If you are genuinely curious about the topic, the interview will work because if you're curious, you're interested. If you're interested, you will make it sound interesting. Okay. 
ask dumb questions. Don't be afraid if you don't know all the answers. The audience probably don't either. Um, get to the point. Don't clutter up the interview with lots of chit chat or what I call waffle. Control the interview because you are in control. Steer the subject in a better direction if the interview starts to get boring. Focus on the solutions, not only the problems. Respect responses. Everyone is entitled to an opinion, hence tolerance. People need more tolerance. Um, end your interviews cleanly. Okay, do a very short goodbye. Don't recap points made during the interview. Just end it off. So I want to read to you this piece on page 186 quickly. From Cole Farber on listening. Most people have never really been listened to. They live in a lonely silence. No one knowing what they feel, how they live or what they have done. They are prisoners of the eyes of others, of the stereotyped, limited, superficial, and often distorted ways that others see them. There are no words to adequately describe what it is to be free with another person. It is most often a sensing that someone will let us be all of what we are, um, of what we are at that moment. We can talk about whatever we wish, express in any way whatever feelings are in our hearts. We can take as much time as we need. We can sit, stand, pace, yell, cry, pound the floor, dance, or weep for joy. Whatever and however we are at the moment is accepted and respected. This experience of freedom and communion helps us to feel that someone is for us. Um, and it is this deep sensing of someone somewhere being for us that breaks into the silent loneliness of our lives and encourages us in the struggle to be human. It helps us to break the tyranny of the stranger's eyes and to give um, and to give to our lives all that we are capable of giving. Because listening can bring about such powerful healing. It is one of the most beautiful gifts that people can give and receive. I absolutely love that piece. But that's listening, okay, in a nutshell. That's what it comes down to. So powerful interviews can rivet an audience to the radio, okay? A powerful interview is like a powerful story. It's something that can pull you in. Boring interviews will make you switch off the radio extremely quickly. The purpose of an interview is to get the interviewee to open up and to reveal information not ordinarily discussed in a public forum on your show. The host needs to make the guest feel comfortable. Listening is the most impor uh, important tool, the most powerful tool of an interview um, or of an interviewer. The star of the interview is the topic or the guest, not you as the host. Don't ask questions that give a yes or a no answer. Questions that start with do, does, or is, etc. Do ask questions which begin with who, what, when, where, why. And then control of the interview is the responsibility of the interviewer. And now we're done with this lesson. Okay, we're continuing with interviews in your next class, which is in person. So it's a contact lesson, which is great. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone's faces in person. Um, any questions for me? Because we covered a lot with regards to interviews today. Okay, so we covered all the phases and we covered the do's and don'ts um, in essence. Um, I just I just want to ask something quickly in terms of interviews, because there was I had I had one client where we had to get him an interview at SAFM. And then we also structured the questions that we'd like them to ask him. So I just want to know if that's a norm because they just they didn't even add more questions that they had themselves they just went through what we had for them and they that's what they asked them so i just want to know if that's a norm for other um, radio stations and all that that is a norm and unfortunately um it's at most that would be like an average interview like a mediocre interview okay because as soon as people, as soon as they are paid interviews, okay, that falls under advertising. People tend to be very lazy with regards to the work that they do. So they will literally um, take your money and ask the five questions that you sent to to be asked on air, and that's it. So yes, that is normal. Um, we do the same. Like I set up 
but okay, the way I set up interviews, um, I try to set up more interesting interviews for when I do have to send people to radio stations for interviews, but no, that's completely normal. Um, most of the most of the time, people will only spend this amount of time if it's someone that they actively want to interview, not because it's paid for by a client. Does that make okay, sense? Thank you. Yeah, perfect okay. sense. Thanks a lot. So Tanda asks, do we need to attend three contact classes next week? There are only two contact classes, but I have to do a third class with you, so I will most probably have to pre-record it and upload it but don't stress about that that's my stress whether it's going to be pre-recorded or um if I, i'll let you know by friday though if it will be a class like this again online so that you can see if you can attend i also record these so um i just cut them and then they will be uploaded then you must have a great rest of your week you are not seeing me for the remainder of this week and we shall chat again next week Okay, thank you, ma'am.